Hey GTC family, we're so excited that you've decided to join us for service this morning. Service begins in five minutes and make sure that you grab all the things that you're going to see coming across the screen so that you're ready to celebrate communion with us, to pray with us, and to worship alongside us this morning. Kids, you're going to want to make sure that you've got all the things that you need to stay engaged. Don't forget to print off the lesson sheets, sermon notes, and to join us in this time of family worship. church family it's time to begin but before we do we just want to open our hearts up to what God wants to do so pause with us as we pray and we invite God and his Holy Spirit into our homes and our spaces of worship this morning Holy Spirit we invite you to do a work in our lives this morning 
Father God, would you move and prove yourself true and real to us this morning. Speak through each one of us, we pray, and I ask that you would have your way here among us this morning. Amen. I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Yeshua now. Well, good morning, church. This morning as we begin, I just want to read to you from, um, from Matthew chapter 21. Verse 8 says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And again, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, this time it's about the return of the king. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And this morning, as we, uh, as we gather in our homes, and as um, it may be, you know, an unfortunate reality that on Palm Sunday, we have to gather in our homes, and we're not able to gather together physically. Um, I, I just encourage you, particularly in these uncertain times, that as we take time to sing, and as we uh, take time as a body corporately, um, to, to just worship the Lord, I encourage you to remember that we're not only remembering the, uh, the entry, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, but we're also ushering him back into his eternal kingdom. And we, his people today, in 2020, in the middle of this uh, pandemic, are saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, Come save us. Come save us. And so why don't you join me in singing wherever you are. Turn to you. 
presence All our fears are washed away Washed away Hosanna Hosanna You are the God who saves us Worthy of all our praises Hosanna Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. So when we see you, so when we see you, we find strength. The Lion of Judah, He 
he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him.
right, church. Just sing this next part. Because no matter where we are, whether we're gathered together or whether we're in our homes, the word says that we're two or three of God, He is in our midst. And so as we sing this next part, just know that He is there with you. You are here. standing in your glory. You are here. You are holy. We are standing in your glory. You are here. You are holy. We are standing in your glory. You are here. with the 
the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of Well, hey kids, I just wanted to bring you a science experiment. I don't know if you've been doing science experiments at home, but I love them. And so here we are, we're gonna do one together. So today I've got a um, pitcher of hydrogen peroxide with just a little bit of dish soap inside of it. And then I've got um, some yeast here mixed in with a little bit of warm water. Now I want to show you this really awesome rock that I've got. And so this rock is actually amethyst and that's a type of quartz. And so we found this on a family vacation one time and it's been laying around the house for forever. But this, I'm gonna tell you the significance of it in a minute. But I'm gonna put this quartz amethyst right in here. Inside, ooh, do you see that? Do you see a little steam coming off? That is so cool. So hydrogen peroxide reacts. Well, I actually don't know what it's reacting with right now because it's not supposed to react yet until I put that yeast in. But I was gonna put in a couple more rocks. So I was gonna put in this clear amethyst and then this one more little amethyst rock. I don't know if you can see it, but it's almost like a prism. It's very cool. Just pop it in there. All right, and then I'm gonna pour this yeast in and see what happens. Oh yeah, there it is. There's the reaction. Do you see it foaming? Oh, I, I thought I chose a big enough. It's just a crow. Ringo, it's just a crow. Ringo, I'm in the middle of filming church. I can't make this up. Do you see this reaction? Oh my goodness. So this yeast is reacting with the hydrogen peroxide and it is creating this crazy foam. You guys should try this at home. It is amazing. Oh, it's so heavy. I don't want to drop it. Okay, well, let me tell you what the significance of this is this morning. Bear with me. So there is a part in the Palm Sunday story. So Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey 
and they're going and everyone is singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're laying their coats down on the road so that he can ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. And this was fulfilling some prophecy that Jesus would be coming as the king, but on a donkey, humbled. You would think a king would arrive on this huge horse and chariot, but no, he was coming in on a donkey. And in Luke chapter 19, this is what it says. Jesus turns and he looks at the Pharisees because they, among the crowd, they were religious leaders and they looked at Jesus and they said, tell them to stop praising you. Tell them to stop cheering you on. They should not be doing that. And Jesus looked at them and he said, if those, if they kept quiet, if my followers kept quiet, the stones along the road would begin to cheer for me. And so this is why I showed you this reaction with the stones inside this hydrogen peroxide and the yeast is bubbling up because the stones would cry out praise to God if we didn't. And so this is just my object lesson to show you this morning that all of creation was made to praise God. And we join in creation in praising the Lord. And so does Ringo. All right, I'm gonna cut to you, Pastor Clark, and clean up this big old mess. Well, good morning, everyone. I know that you've already been welcomed, but uh, it is so good to be together. And uh, thank you, Pastor Rachel and Pastor Yeshua for leading us in different parts of our gathering already. And we're gonna take some time now to come to some scripture, to come to the word. And then we're gonna close with a time of communion together. And uh, we just want to pray before uh, we read the scripture. I'd just like us to pause and pray if we can. And I'd ask you to invite God to speak to you through his word. I just believe that when we come to God's word and we open our hearts to what God wants to speak to us, then we can be transformed. God's word has um, an effect in our lives that will change us. And we just need to come with an open heart and with open ears and with a heart that says, God, I, I want to know your voice in my life today. So why don't we take a moment and pray? Would you join with me as you're in your living rooms, wherever you might be? Let's take a minute to pray. So Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active. We thank you that your presence is with us and that you are longing to speak something to our hearts today. I pray that our hearts would be open to you and that our ears would be willing to hear and that our hearts would be hungry to know your presence as we look into your word. And so, Spirit of God, would you make the word of God alive to us this morning, that it would change us in some way and that we would know uh, your presence through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 19. And uh, if you'd like to turn there, I invite you to do that. I will read uh, part of it for you in just a moment. But while you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had an experience of mistaken identity? And perhaps it went something like this. You were outside working in your yard or you were walking uh, out for a walk, and you saw a vehicle approaching that you recognized, and you began to wave because there was someone in that vehicle that uh, was a friend of yours, and you were just excited to see them. And as that vehicle got closer, it kind of began to pass in front of you, and you saw a face peering out of the window at you that was a face you did not recognize, and you realize that's not my friend at all. What an awkward moment. And so your wave kind of turns into a, you know, just fixing my hair or you kind of just turned away and pretended like it never happened. Uh, those, are, those are embarrassing, awkward moments because we've made a mistake and uh, we don't know that person. And the fact of the matter is that we recognize people uh, by their features. We recognize them as we get to know them. We might recognize them by their voice. You might hear someone talking in another room and you don't even have to see them. You know who that person is because you've gotten to know them and you have their different features that you recognize about who they are. If there was a title that I was going to give to our time in scripture today, it would be recognizing Jesus. 
And I'd love for us to explore the question this morning for a few moments, and I'll pose this question to you. Do you recognize Jesus? Do you know Jesus and, and the different aspects of who he is and, and the role that he fills in God's plan and how he wants to speak into your life today? Do you recognize Jesus? You know, all through scripture, we get uh, flashes of illumination that reveal to us who Jesus is. We find in the Old Testament, there's prophecies that begin to point us to who Jesus is. And then when we come to the New Testament, we find it's, uh, it, it opens up a whole new understanding of who Jesus is. And over time, we begin to understand and recognize Jesus. I read a story about a man who wanted to go and visit Mount Rushmore. I don't know if you've been there. I haven't. Would love to visit someday. And Mount Rushmore is famous for the faces of four well-known uh, men whose faces are carved into the side of that mountain. And there's Washington, there's Roosevelt, there's Jefferson, and I believe there's Lincoln. And their faces have been carved into the side of this mountain. What a monumental task. Well, a man wanted to go and see this. And unfortunately, he arrived too late to be able to, to see this mountain with daylight. It was dark by the time he arrived. And to top it all off, there was a, a tremendous thunderstorm that he could hear the rumblings of a storm moving in over that mountain. But he stood there at the base of that mountain trying to catch a glimpse. But it was dark. He couldn't see. But as that storm came in, it brought lightning as well. And every time a lightning flashed, there was this brief moment of illumination. And he just caught a little glimpse of the faces on Mount Rushmore. And that lightning storm passed through that area. And there were numbers of times where there was this brief flash of illumination. And by the time that thunderstorm passed, he had a pretty good idea of what those faces looked like. Well, Jesus, uh, this morning, as we are going to read the scripture in Luke chapter 19, Luke is a doctor who lived in Jesus' time, and he took time to record uh, much of Jesus' life. We're going to read something this morning that illuminates to us an aspect of who Jesus is. And so I want to just read that for you. <clears throat> it's in Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 36, and I'll read to verse 40. But just listen uh, or follow along. I'm reading in the NLT version, New Living Translation. Uh, let's just peer into a moment that illuminates something of who Jesus is. Luke chapter 19, and I'll just begin uh, at verse 36. So the, the context really quickly is this. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Uh, it's the last week of his life. And uh, he has asked his disciples to go get the colt of a donkey, uh, a colt of, uh, full of a donkey. And then he uh, begins to ride on this into the city. Verse 35, so they, the disciples, brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Then the crowd spread out their coats on the road ahead of Jesus. As they reached the place where the road started down from the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all of the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees, some of the religious leaders among the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Now, today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday derives its name, gets its name from this scene in Scripture, where there is a scene of celebration. There are large crowds that have heard that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and they have heard some incredible things about Jesus. In fact, they heard that just recently, a few days before, that he had raised a man from the dead. Lazarus was his name. And so they're hearing these things about Jesus. They hear that he's coming into town and they go and they meet him. And there's this festive scene where Jesus is coming in 
to town. And scripture says that they take off their cloaks, their outer garments, and they begin to lay those cloaks down in front of Jesus as he's riding on that, that donkey into, uh, toward Jerusalem. Matthew records in another gospel that people also began to take palm branches and they would strip the palm branches off the trees and they would lay them down in front of Jesus. And that's where we get the name for this Sunday in the Christian calendar. We call it Palm Sunday. And it reminds us of that scene. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, we could put it in this way, that that crowd began to roll out the red carpet for Jesus. Uh, have you ever used that expression where someone important is coming into town and, and you hear this expression, we're going to roll out the red carpet for them. You know, maybe it's royalty. Uh, I remember a number of Canada days ago, um, we heard that Prince Charles was going to be in Ottawa uh, for a special celebration on that Canada day. So we went into where he was going to be. And um, as it happened, uh, the kids, Karis and, and uh, uh, Carrie Lynn was there with them. I was standing back trying to get some pictures. But a lot of the kids got close enough that when Prince Charles walked by, he was right in front of them and he actually stopped and he shook their hand. And there's something thrilling about meeting royalty. Uh, and that day, as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, the crowd felt the same way. Here was someone that they began to recognize as a king, as royalty. And there was a buzz in the crowd. They were excited about who they thought Jesus was and what they thought he was going to do. Now, the Pharisees in the crowd that day, they were not happy with this. And they said to Jesus, they referred to him as teacher. Okay, Jesus, well, we will acknowledge you're a good teacher, but a king? No way. You got to rebuke your followers. You cannot accept this title of king. You are not a king, is what they were saying. And yet Jesus seems to accept this recognition that people were calling him a king. He didn't reject that. And he seemed to receive that. In fact, by coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, he actually fulfilled a prophecy that we find 500 years before this moment. And there's a prophet named Zechariah. And he says this in Zechariah 9.9. He says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king, here he uses that word, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and he is victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And 500 years before this scene, the prophet Zechariah prophesied that there would be a king that would come. And he would come into Jerusalem riding on a, a colt. And so this scene is now unfolding. Jesus is receiving this title of king. He's not telling people to stop calling him a king. And so in this passage, we begin to recognize there's a flash of illumination that Jesus is a king of sorts. He was someone with tremendous authority. Yet he was humble, Scripture says. He was coming to triumph over something, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. He was coming to bring victory, and Scripture says that Jesus was righteous. And so here we find this celebratory mood where people are saying there is something incredibly important about Jesus. In fact, we think he's a king. But then the scene kind of abruptly takes an unexpected change. And Jesus comes to a point where he is overlooking Jerusalem. And scripture says that something strange happens in that moment. I want to read it for you. We're just going to continue on from where I left off. And so Luke chapter 19, verse 41, says this. But as they came closer to Jerusalem, and Jesus saw the city ahead, he began to cry. Another translation says he began to weep. There was a, a deep sorrow that he began to feel. And so Jesus is weeping. He's crying. And this is what he said. He said, I wish that even today you would find the way of peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from you. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and will encircle you and close in on you. They will crush you to the ground and your children with you. 
Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you have rejected the opportunity that God has offered you. You know, Jesus begins to weep because he knew that very soon the crowd that was celebrating him as a king, very soon they would turn on him and actually be asking for his death. And this is why that happened. They realized that instead of coming as an earthly king to set up a new form of government and to overthrow the Roman rule, Jesus was not coming to do any of those things. And the crowd thought that that was the kind of king that he was going to be. And when they discovered that he was not going to overthrow the the government that was ruling at the time, the Romans, he was not going to set himself up with an earthly government, then they turned on him and they began to ask for his death. And Jesus uh, is just lamenting the fact that they were missing the true peace that he was going to bring. You see, they thought that peace would come if Jesus instituted a new political system. They thought that was the answer to their problems, and Jesus knew it wasn't. And so what was Jesus coming to do? Well, Jesus was coming to bring peace. He weeps because people were missing this. He knew that a a new government would not bring inward peace to anyone. And so Jesus came so that we could have peace with God. Jesus came so that we could experience an inward peace, an inward transformation, an inward joy and a hope that comes from the presence of God in our lives. And so Jesus did come to bring victory, but it wasn't over a political system. He came to bring victory over sin, over our own sinfulness, so that we would no longer be enslaved to the sin that that can take a hold of us and keep us in slavery inwardly. And so Jesus was a king. He came with tremendous authority. But the the realm, the kingdom in which he was working, or he wants to work, is the kingdom of our hearts. And so Jesus came to work in the hearts of men and women. And the good news is this, that if we allow him to be the king of our lives then we can begin to experience transformation. So the question again is this, as we come to communion, do you recognize Jesus? Do you know him as king? You know, what what does that really mean? What does it mean to recognize Jesus as the king of your life? Well, it means this. It means to lay down your life as a cloak, so to speak. Right? The people that were calling Jesus king that day, they laid down their cloaks as a... a, um, just a demonstration of honor to Jesus. And what Jesus asks us to do is to lay down our lives before him and to ask him to guide our lives, to to dethrone ourselves and to enthrone Jesus in our hearts, in our lives, and to ask him to guide us, to ask him to forgive us of our sin. And the amazing thing is that when you recognize Jesus and when you enthrone him in your life, then a remarkable thing happens. You begin to change. And Jesus begins to bring his rule and his reign and his power and his authority at the level of our hearts. You know, Jesus came to bring victory over sin. And when he went to the cross, he took your sin and my sin. He paid the debt for sin that a just and a holy God Needed that there needed to be a consequence for sin, but the scripture says that God laid on Jesus your sin and my sin and and our weakness and our failures and our shortcomings, and Jesus bore the weight of that to the cross, which we'll talk about on Good Friday, and He conquered sin. So He brought victory. He not only conquered sin, but He conquered the enemy of our souls. There's an enemy of our souls. Satan, who is out to steal, kill, to destroy, to bring ruin to your life. But when you give your life to Jesus, when you surrender to his authority, invite him to do his work in your life, then you are no longer uh, powerless and at the whim of the enemy. But Jesus has defeated the power of the enemy as well. And you and I can know true life as we enthrone Jesus in our lives. And so do you recognize Jesus? I hope today that if you've never considered who Jesus is, if you've never acknowledged that 
You need freedom inwardly. I want to point you to Jesus, that he has brought victory over those things. No political system can do that in your heart or in mine. No government authority can change the human heart, but God can. And that's what he's come to do through Jesus. We're going to take a moment now to, um, to celebrate communion. And uh, I, want to just, um, I want to just lead us through that. Uh, hopefully you have some juice, juice that you pre- just have nearby that's ready. And maybe a, loaf, a piece of bread or a bun. It doesn't really matter specifically. But I want to just read a couple of chapters forward. We've been looking at Luke chapter 19. Just a few short days later. Jesus had his last meal with his followers, and this is where he instituted what we call communion. And it's in um, Luke chapter 22. I'll read that for you, and then we'll celebrate communion together. Jesus uh, says this. Then at the proper time, Scripture says, Jesus and the twelve apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I have looked forward to this hour with deep longing anxious to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat it again until it comes to fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks for it, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Then He took a loaf of bread, and when he had thanked God for it, he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This wine is the token of God's new covenant, God's new agreement with mankind to save you, an agreement sealed with the blood that I will pour out for you. And so we come to a moment together, this is how we'll close, of just celebrating uh, communion, of thanking God for sending Jesus, and of thanking Jesus for what he's done for us. So I'm going to invite you just to take that bread, and uh, you may want to just take a piece and pass it around to your family members if you're celebrating this with family or friends. And why don't we do what Jesus asks us to do, to just take the bread as a symbol of his body that was broken for us. And to say, thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for me. Let's just take that with thanksgiving. Just take a moment to thank um, thank Jesus for his willing sacrifice. And then Jesus said that we are to take the cup. And the cup represents uh, his blood that was shed for us. And that that blood and the giving of his life satisfied God's righteous demand for sin. And your sin and my sin was paid in full. And we can walk in forgiveness. Let's take the cup and remember with thanksgiving. I'm just going to close this in a word of prayer, but if you'd like to take some time after we're finished to just uh, take time as a family to pray, to be thankful, feel free to do that. Why don't we pray as we close? Father, we just thank you for a glimpse through your word of who you are, Jesus. You are King. Thank you for the victory that you have brought over sin, over the enemy of our souls, and for the freedom that we can walk in because of what you have done. We are so grateful. I pray that we would sense your presence through this week as we walk through perhaps challenging times ahead. Jesus, that we invite your presence, we invite uh, your authority in our lives, that you would help us to walk and to experience abundant life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We're so glad you joined us for church this morning. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. 
All of our events and links can be found on our website at www.gtcarmprior.ca. Make sure to share, like, subscribe, and we'll see you throughout the week. Until next Sunday, bye-bye.